Still me. Good evening. I am Stephanie Rule. It is midnight on the East Coast, 9 p.m. in the West, and we are following breaking news on Capitol Hill. There is finally a deal in the Senate to fund the government. Friday morning, the House passed a $1.2 trillion government funding bill, which then went to the Senate for a vote. The Senate is still in session tonight. We're going to have more on that in a moment. There was also no surprise drama in the House today when far-right Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to remove Republican Speaker Mike Johnson. She made that move even as the House was voting on the spending bill, which she then voted against. I am saying the clock has started. It's time for our conference to choose a new speaker. Mike Johnson, the Republican Speaker of the House, handed over every ounce of negotiating power to Chuck Schumer and the Democrats and went ahead and funded the government when this was our point of leverage. Also, the Republican majority in the House became even narrower today. Congressman Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin, who already announced he was resigning, is headed for the exits earlier than expected. He is leaving Congress April 19th. That will bring the House GOP majority down to just one single vote, and that seat will be empty until November. With that, let's get smarter with the help of our lead-off panel, NBC senior national reporter Sahil Kapoor, John Allen, senior national politics reporter for NBC, former Democratic Congressman Connor Lamb, and former Republican Congressman Charlie Dent, both of the, from the state of Pennsylvania, so he'll set the stage for us. What is happening in the Senate as we speak? Well, Stephanie, the Senate just began voting on this unanimous consent agreement that was locked in moments ago. We're expecting six roll call votes on Republican amendments. Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, said he wants them to be limited to 10 minutes. We'll see if that actually happens. It's very difficult to get senators to move that quickly on anything. Uh, and then after those are done, there are three voice votes on amendments as well, which are expected to be wrapped up instantly, and then final passage of the bill. So sometime in the next hour to two hours, probably, we should get this bill passed. It has already passed the House, as you just pointed out. Then it heads to President Biden's desk, who has said he will sign it. There will be a brief shutdown, but it'll be temporary. It'll be technical. It's not going to have any meaningful impact for all intents and purposes. Uh, they have figured this out. They have ended this appropriations process six months after the fiscal year began. I've never seen anything quite like this. It took four stopgap bills and months and months of negotiating uh, after the fiscal year had, had begun. And they've got the next fiscal year uh, coming up in just six months, and they have barely even begun that process. So stay tuned for what comes next. So when does this all wrap up? When are we going to have a vote complete? Well, sometime in the next hour or two. This really depends on how quickly senators are able to uh, vote and to move uh, through these amendments. So sometime, my guess is sometime in the next hour or so, uh, hour to two, they'll vote on final passage of the bill. Then it'll go to President Biden's desk, who has said he'll sign it. Uh, he has called on Congress to pass this quickly. Remember, Stephanie, they just released this bill yesterday. It's more than a thousand pages. It spends more than a trillion dollars. You know, you can understand why a lot of lawmakers had complaints about the process of how this came together. This is what happens, as I just told you uh, recently, uh, when you save things until the 11th hour to do your job. Charlie, this whole thing is ridiculous, disappointing, uh, pathetic. How is it that we are still doing this when it comes to keeping government running? I have said this a thousand times. If this were any private business on planet Earth, the CEO would be ousted. They would be bankrupt, over, done with. But this is theoretically the most important business in America, our government. Well, Stephanie, this all could have been wrapped up in December. And I mean that. They, they kicked this off into the new year uh, because the speaker was worried about a rear guard action if he cut a deal with the Democrats, which he knew he was going to have to do to pass the appropriations bill. So that's why this thing has been kicked out the Middle East. It is not the way to run the railroad. I was on the appropriations committee for many years. I helped negotiate one of the spending bills. These things were ready. But again, it's all because of internal divisions within the House Republican Conference. They didn't want to face the reality of this inevitable bipartisan compromise with over 100 Republicans voting for it and a whole lot of Democrats voting for it in the House. Same thing's going to happen in the Senate. But it's because of fear. A lot of these members don't, too many of these members don't want to govern. They don't think it's their responsibility. And so they, they want, you know, many of them, by the way, they hope yes, then they vote no. They don't want the government to shut down most of them. Uh, but they can't vote for a bill because they're afraid of some kind of a primary uh, against them over, you know, just doing their jobs. 
Okay, then if doing your job and reaching across the aisle and working with someone from an opposing party is something that you're going to get in trouble for, Connor, are we going to get to a point where they can't pass anything? Well, I just think we're going to get to the point where the Republicans won't be in the majority anymore. I mean, they're just discrediting we're themselves at every turn. Yeah, I mean, they might actually do it to themselves, which I don't think anyone really anticipated. But um, Charlie's right. The writing was on the wall for this thing for months. Everybody knew this was how it was going to end. Um, it's amazing that Marjorie Taylor Greene is the one now calling for Mike Johnson's head because she used to be for Kevin McCarthy, who was the one that did all these same spending bills to begin with, which got him fired. So now she's against the guy who was supposed to take, you know, a harder line on spending bills. It's really just, um, it's just mind blowing. And, and I don't have an answer for you because they don't have an answer for themselves. There's just no leadership there. There's a vacuum. Okay, John. So Marjorie Taylor Greene is is potentially looking to push out Mike Johnson and Democrats like Tom Swazi are saying, no, we want to be sure we protect him. What is going on? And specifically, what's Marjorie Taylor Greene up to? Right. She doesn't have any independent thoughts. She does whatever Donald Trump tells her what to do. She's certainly not going to do anything uh, that uh, is at odds with what Donald Trump wants. Right. She's uh, had some interest in the vice presidency, some interest in potentially a cabinet spot. She's very close to President Trump, or at least um, uh, presents herself as such. So um, this is what she's up to, I think. Uh, I surmise, uh, as uh, the congressman pointed out a moment ago, she helped uh, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, she got on the wrong side of uh, of the anti-government base uh, on the Repo of the Republican Party, and now she's doing some makeup. Um, you know, she wants to get rid of Mike Johnson. I think it's possible that there's a little bit of payback here for him, uh, given that she was uh, somebody who was so, so closely supportive of Kevin McCarthy. But at the end of the day, what you've got here, uh, Stephanie, is a significant number of Republicans who aren't just in what Congressman Dent said about uh, the hope, yes, vote, no caucus. There are members of Congress who have been sent here to oppose the government continuing to operate, right? Uh, there is no uh, appropriations bill that they will ever vote for. There is no amount of uh, clipping back spending that they can say, hey, that's acceptable because uh, of this primary challenge, because of this fear. It used to be they were all hope, yes, some voted no. Now there's a whole bunch of them, not, not the majority, but certainly enough of them with such thin uh, majorities you're talking about before with Mike Gallagher retiring, enough of them uh, to throw sand in the gears every time uh, legislation comes to the floor, and certainly every time it's about the government spending any money to continue functioning. Charlie, do you agree with that, that, that chaos in the House on the Republican side is no accident? It's by design? Well, yeah, there, there is an element, as John has pointed out, uh, there, is, uh, there is an element within the House Republican Conference that is what I would term as the rejectionist wing, these real hardliners who don't want to govern, who will never vote for an appropriations bill, who are never going to vote for this deal but did everything they could uh, to, to drag this thing out as far as they can. They make demands all the time. I want this. I want that. But the, at the end of the day, though, you know, the way it works in Washington is those who, who uh, are voting for the bills get to determine the content. But what's so screwed up in Washington is that there are these members out there who are making these ridiculous demands, and leadership listens to them and lets them help drive this process, even though they know they will not be part of the inevitable solution. Those types of people need to be marginalized and ignored, frankly, but they keep bringing them in. It didn't, didn't start with Mike Johnson. This has been going on for many years now in, in the conference, in the House Republican Conference, and it's really, it's really got to end. But those who vote for the bills determine the content, not those who are voting against the bills. Very simple. Sahil, what reporting do you have about what's going on in the House? Well, it's been a very bad day for House Republicans. Let's start with that. I mean, first off, you had okay, a majority well, hold, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell me when the last time you said it's been a very good day for House Republicans. Let me put it this way. I can't remember the last time they had this bad a day. Um, it's been a very, very tumultuous and narrow majority, uh, as I think all the guests on this panel will agree with. But today was, was unusual in the sense that it distilled all the fractures and the governing struggles and the infighting and the disenchantment among institutionalists like Mike Gallagher, who have decided at the age of 40, a rising star in the party, that he's done with this, that he's going to walk away. Uh, the fact that Ken Buck is leaving is indicative of the fact that, you know, he's being pushed out because he demanded that party leaders stand up and emphatically reject 
the so-called big lie, the idea that the 2020 election was stolen. He wanted the next speaker after McCarthy was evicted to stand up and make clear that the 2020 election was legitimate, that Joe Biden won, Donald Trump lost. That didn't really sit well with his party. And from there, it became a downward spiral for him. So that's, the, again, part of what happened. And, and on the governing front, a majority of Republicans voted against this funding deal, you know, which, as Connor correctly pointed out, is very much an extension of what Kevin McCarthy was doing. This was that top-line bill, uh, that top-line spending deal that Kevin McCarthy struck all the way back then. There were four stopgap bills in the meantime. He lost his job for the first one of them. Mike Johnson did three more of them and didn't lose his job. There's a real reluctance, despite the, the ac recent activities of Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, among Republicans to actually remove the speaker because they saw what happened last time. They're deeply battle-scarred from it. They face an enormous amount of pushback. And what did they get out of it? You'd be you'd be hard-pressed to ask any of those eight Republicans who evicted Kevin McCarthy to explain what they have gotten out of it. Most of them will tell you, like Chip Roy, uh, for instance, who didn't vote to remove McCarthy, but he will tell you that they've gotten nothing out of it and nothing has really changed. Connor, is there a way for Democrats, I can't even believe I'm asking this, to take advantage of the GOP's infighting? Yeah, I mean, if, if by take advantage, you mean just sort of do the job that they were elected to and get a few members to come over to their side to support some legislation. Absolutely. I think that was much closer last time than anyone realizes. I know some Democrats personally that were in very close and involved talks with Republicans over funding for Ukraine and a couple other big priorities um, if they were willing to um, you know, sort of cooperate on the leadership fight last time. So it was extremely close, didn't quite get there. I think now that the Republicans have lost a couple of additional members and it's even closer and they're even more disgusted with their own side, absolutely. But I wouldn't call that taking advantage. I, I mean, I honestly think there's just a lot of people in the Democratic caucus that would like to do what they were sent there to do, which is pass some bills. Okay, but what about...